Yes, I am excited about this new series that we are diving in to really kick off this new year. Um, we are going to be studying the book of Daniel in the Bible. We find it in the Old Testament. And we've entitled this series, Daniel, Conviction in a Culture of Compromise. In this book, you'll find the sovereignty of God over the affairs of the world, but you'll also find how to live and be faithful in the midst of a culture that is opposed to the God of the Bible. You know, January is the beginning of the year, but it is nearing the end of the NFL season. And it's this time of the year where teams are really battling for home field advantage to get into the playoffs. Home field advantage matters. We know that it's significant. Um, it does make a difference. The Philadelphia Eagles are 6-2 and two this year at home. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys are 8-0 and oh at home this year. So it matters. There are real reasons behind this phenomenon. And one of the major reasons is the fact that the crowd, the home team, is louder. Their emotions are going to uh, really have an impact in the game. It can change the momentum of the game for those who have you know, home field advantage. In any given football uh, team, there is 11, you know, in, on that field, there's 11 players that are playing in each play of the football game. But the crowd itself is actually known as the 12th man. Yeah, it matters. For the football players, it matters as well because they actually get to sleep in their own bed that night before. So they're much more comfortable. They don't have to be at a hotel. They're more comfortable playing on their field as well. Uh, they don't have to take the road trip and experience jet lag or some type of travel fatigue. It really matters when you have home field advantage. There was once a time in America that if you were a Christian, you had home field advantage. Right? It was like you had home field advantage if you were a Christian in America because on Sunday mornings, pretty much everything else was closed. Sundays, the stores were closed, and so you didn't really have that many options but to come to church. There was a time where people had a certain reverence about the, about the scriptures. Uh, Christian values were not only enforced at home, but they were actually encouraged in other institutions and, and at your job and in your workplace. There was a time where Christians were actually looked upon favorably. Not so much today, right? Some of you all know that that's not how it works today. For, for most people or for many people, Sundays is just another day off, right? People really look at the scriptures differently. They don't see them as sacred text anymore. The Christian values are considered closed-minded. It's just it's kind of restrictive. And people don't see Christians as favorable as they used to. They see them as, uh, as critical or judgmental. It's a difference. In America, we are now living in a post-Christian America. We no longer have home field advantage. And that's important because when you begin to share your values, your Christian values, when you begin to assert what you believe, the society might boo you. <laughs> boo! We don't want to hear that. But how do you survive? How do you win when the majority of society, when the rest of the crowd is against you? I hope we can learn a few answers to that question today in a message that I've entitled, Success Without Home Field Advantage. Success Without Home Field Advantage. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you um, for this account of Daniel. We thank you for his struggles because it was in his struggles that we see that you were able to encourage him, strengthen him, build him up, and make him a winner. God, we ask that you would help us to 
see your scriptures in a way that it might apply to our daily lives so that we might be winners. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to start right at the top of the book of Daniel. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 1. For those of you um, who are here, you can look at the screen. You can follow along with us. We'll see right here at the beginning of the chapter, it really does provide a historical setting for the entire book. Let's just dive right in in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. We see here that it was the Lord's doing. The scripture says that the Lord handed King Jehoiakim of the Israelites over to King Nebuchadnezzar. The people were now uh, in bondage and they had to be, they were held in captivity and taken all the way to the land of Babylon. Actually have a map, you can take a look at it, you can see where Jerusalem is and you can see the trip that they were forced to take to this foreign land of Babylon. If you look at the map, you can see that Babylon is where modern day Iraq is today. Uh, The city of Babylon is not far from Baghdad. We have an elder here at Central that is a chaplain for the U.S. Army, and he will be doing a one-year tour of duty this year, and we're going to be praying for him this month until he returns, and so we'll be praying for him. But the siege and the captivity was a fulfillment of the warning that that the Israelites, um, the prophets specifically, were telling the people the prophets warned the people that if they did not stop worshiping idols and that they did not follow the law, that they would then be taken into captivity. And sure enough, the prophecy was fulfilled. So 70 years of captivity in Babylon was their punishment. And we see that here in the text. They are taken to what would have been considered the most wicked city on the planet. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king, and he ruled with an iron fist. He had absolute authority, meaning by his word, he could have thousands of people slaughtered, no questions asked. But he wasn't known for just killing. He was known for torturing people. The Babylonians knew that it would be difficult for them to conquer large areas of land and remain in control without a strategy. And their strategy was to go in and take some of the best and the brightest of the, of, the, of the men, train them up to become citizens of, uh, of Babylonia, and then go back and lead the people that they had basically enslaved and, and took over the land. They didn't just choose anybody, though. Look at what the scripture says in verse 3. The king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, good looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. They, in essence, would go and cherry pick those who they felt had the capacity to learn quickly, had the intelligence that looked good so that they would be able to go through a three-year training process. It was like taking them off to college and indoctrinating them so that they would be able to lead effectively over other people. They would handpick teenagers to develop them, spend that time, so that they would go back and lead people as a faithful Babylonian. And this was an assimilation process that they would take them through. That required a certain level of isolation from their home and their family and from other people. Look at what it says in verse 4. He was to teach them the Chaldean language 
and literature. So this was an indoctrination process where they begin to train them with new history, train them with different values, a different mindset altogether. Their intent was to train, educate, develop these leaders so that they would become loyal Babylonians. This was intentional. Daniel and the rest of these teenagers were already educated in the word of God, though. We know that based on how they respond to the, the message that they were given. So whatever the Babylonians were teaching these teenagers, it would first go through the filter of the Old Testament text, which they had already learned. And if you really study uh, uh, the Israelites and the traditions during that time, they had to memorize portions of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And so they had already had this in their system. So when they, the, the Babylonians began to try to indoctrinate them, it didn't stick. It leads me to my first point, and that is that we have to rely on your God-given information. Your God-given information. It's important if you are a follower of Jesus that you have a clear understanding of what the word teaches, and that requires you to study and learn. I say study because oftentimes we think we can just look at us, you know, look or listen to a sermon, and that's enough. It's not. You're going to have to study the word of God to develop your own uh, uh, biblical worldview so that when you study the text, you know it for yourself. Because society will continue to teach you something different. And you'll have to be able to filter that and understand what it is that you actually believe. The major institutions of today's society are God-denying institutions. You may say to yourself, well, I'll just kind of remain neutral. You can because trust me, your society will continue to feed you information. You will believe in something. Whether you like it or not, it's coming. And it's important that you make a choice, that you're going to follow God's given instructions that we find in the word of God. My son is in his final year of college. He had finished most of his uh, uh, primary curriculum that he needed to, to say. There's some core courses that you have to take for his major. So he had an opportunity to take some additional electives to finish all of his credits. And one of the electives that he decided to choose was the Bible. He goes to a secular university, and he thought, man, they're actually going to teach me the Bible in college. He's like, this is going to be easy. I, I've grown up knowing the scriptures, and I thought, man, that's, that's great. So I, I encouraged him to take the course. And when he took the course, he was surprised because the teacher of the course was a mean, foul-mouthed woman who did everything she could to discredit the scriptures. She spent an entire semester trying to dismantle the truth of the Bible and, and discredit and defame the name of Jesus. My son, I was praying for him because I'm like, okay, what in the world? My son would come on and be like, Dad, you would not believe what she said about the scriptures. And I would have to help him to kind of get through that. Thank God he did well in the class, but he wasn't re-indoctrinated on what the scriptures taught him. He had to pay for this class. <laughs> Think about it. At our universities. He felt sad for the people who sat in that class and hadn't had the, 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 the proper education to know what the scriptures actually taught. And he thought to himself, he said, man, I think that the damage that this teacher caused may be irreversible in their understanding of theology. You have to be able to rely on God's given information and study it and know it for yourself today. I believe that uneducated Christians are no longer capturing the world. Instead, the world is holding us captive. And he, the world society will pull you away. You know it because you'll start to become desensitized to things that you see. The stuff that used to make you blush in those commercials, now it's just normal. Things like getting high and fornication seems to be 
no longer taboo, even among the Christian community. There's no shock and awe when you hear some of the stuff that happens. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but there should be a sense of, uh, of, of honor to the things that we do. and should, There should be some boundaries to what goes on. And I'm telling you, you cannot remain neutral. If you're not in the word of God, you will slowly be drifted off. And so we have to have a solid foundation. So when that secular education hits you, you'll be able to take it through the grid of divine truth, which is the word of God. Let's keep moving. Verse six, among them from the Judahites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. So here we see that Daniel was not alone in his class. He had some classmates. And all of his classmates, including himself, they, they had Hebrew names. And their names linked them to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their names meant something. It was significant to them. So Daniel's name meant God is judge. Hananiah meant Jehovah is gracious. Mishael meant he that is God. And Azariah means the Lord helps. But the Babylonians changed their name. Daniel to Belt, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? They changed their name so that they might erase their heritage. This was an intent to indoctrinate them, but also change their identity so that they didn't know who they were. So they, this was a deep process where they wanted to dismantle all of their Jewish heritage. So they changed their name. Daniel is the author of this book. We know that because in, like in chapter 7, he jumps over and he says, I did this and I did that. So we know that he's the author. And Daniel refers himself through the book as Daniel, which tells us that he didn't fall for it. Although they called him a different name, he knew who he was, and he would not let them to change his internal identity. Daniel wasn't drinking the Kool-Aid. He wasn't. He was like, okay, is that what you want to call me? I know who I am. Kind of leads me to this next point. That is that we have to rely on your God-given identification. Your God-given identification. If you're a citizen of the United States of America, you have dual citizenship if you are an American citizen and you are part of the kingdom of God. This citizenship that we have in the U.S. is, is temporary, but the one that we have for the kingdom of God is eternal. And that means that it supersedes our, our total identity. And at this point, they were now trying to be indoctrinated and changing what they thought about who they were. I do believe that we are right now in the midst of a social epidemic of fear, anxiety, and depression for a reason. The reason is, is that we're allowing the society and social media to tell us who we are. And it's causing people to, be, to really become depressed. But when you are a part of the kingdom of God, we go to the scriptures, discover who we are. And when you study the scriptures, you'll find it starts out in Genesis chapter one. The first book of the Bible says that we're created in the image of God. Yeah. Psalm 139 says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. You get into, sec into the New Ch Testament, you'll see in first Timothy. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, in first Peter chapter two, that we are considered chosen, holy and royal. Romans chapter eight gives us the confidence that we have a God that loves us so much that he says nothing will separate us from the love of God. But if you hear from the society, you'll, they'll tell you that this Bible will damage you. That's what you'll hear today. But when you study the scriptures, it gives you real meaning. It gives you real purpose. The study the scriptures will give you self-confidence. It'll give you self-affirmation. 
the scriptures will give you ultimately self-respect because you know who you are in Christ. You have value. You have meaning. You have purpose. This is a wonderful book to help people understand because when you understand it, you know who you are and why we're here. It's important that you rely on God's given information. The Bible is God's written revelation of himself to mankind, but the Bible is also a mirror into who we are. And when we understand that, it gives us real meaning and purpose. Let's keep going. Verse 8. It says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Daniel and the rest of his comrades are now tempted to compromise. This was a compromise uh, to eat the food of the Babylonians. For the Babylonians, the food that they would be eating would have been the best of the best. Yeah, the good stuff. They were being trained. But for the Israelites, this was against Leviticus chapter 11. They understood this because in that chapter, God had given the people of God specific criteria as to what they should ingest. And certain meats, certain foods, the way food was prepared was given to them by God. In this particular wine, which there was no prohibition against wine, but the wine that they would give these uh, these Jewish boys would have been dedicated to idols. The meat would have been already sacrificed and dedicated to idols. So then they would feed the people the food and the wine, and it was really a form of worship to the idols. Well, at this point, uh, Daniel is like, uh, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's what we're going to do. Now, let me just pause for a minute and tell you that uh, eating restrictions that we find in Leviticus chapter 11 does not apply for us today, okay? Uh, we see that when Jesus comes, he ushers in a new covenant. In Mark chapter 7, if you're home, you can write it down. Mark chapter 7, type that in. If you're watching online, you can see that Jesus explains to his disciples that what they ingest or take in does not defile them. You can go over into Acts chapter 10, all right? And we see that the Holy Spirit moves. God then gives Peter a specific vision. And in that vision, he is educated that what he is to ingest does not defile him, all right? So I just want you to know, if you're watching now, that you can eat which, what, whatever is this, <laughs> that's digestible, and it will not defile you based upon the scriptures. But during that time, God had carved out his people to live differently and this was one of those specifications. And Daniel is like, wait a minute. I, I can't do that. I can't, I can't eat that. We need to come up with the plan B. And this takes a certain level of courage here. It takes a lot of courage because we know that this could have been a problem. Look at verse 12. This is what he does. He comes up with a plan B. He says, please Test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now think, the chief eunuch, he has been castrated and dedicated to the king. This man is fully devoted. And Daniel was like, hey, this right here, let's come up with another plan because this isn't going to fit what we have for us. And I have three small points about how we need to rely on God, but there's one big point that I want you to hold on to. I have a picture that describes this, because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, and that is at one point in your lifestyle, you need to draw a line in the sand. That's right. You've got to draw a line in the sand. The, the society is going to come at you, and you've got to get to a point where you say, no, 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 no. Nah, I'm not going there. And Daniel says, hold on, I'm going to have to draw a line in the sand. That means that you have to come up with certain boundaries and limits to your behavior, to your lifestyle. 
he's drawing a line in the sand and saying, we've got to come up with some, something else. And he has to depend on, 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 on his, not only his God-given wisdom, but favor of God, that, the, that, that God would protect him in spite of whatever was going to happen. Like what Alexander Hamilton said, you may have heard this before, those who stand for nothing fall for anything. If you're going to be a believer, you need to have true convictions, hold to true principles in your life. In everything that you do, there needs to be a, a, a line drawn in the sand. There's some limits and boundaries to what you look at on TV, your movies, on your cell phone. I don't know where your line is, but it needs to be a line in the sand. There should be a line in the sand in terms of what you're going to do on your job and tell you there's some jobs that will teach you or tell you to do something that is going to be outside of the boundaries of the scriptures. You're going to have to draw a line in the sand and trust God. When it comes to what happens in your home, I don't care what goes on across the street with little Jeffrey and they out all night. No, in my home, there's a line in the sand. You got to be in the house at a certain time. There's certain relationships. If you're not married, you need to be in that relationship. Yeah, I'm happy about you and your relationship, but some things in your relationship, you need to draw a say, I'm not going to be here all night with you, right? Nah, we're not going to do it. We're not going to go that far. At some point, if you're a believer, you got to draw a line in the sand and say, nah, nah. We, we're not going, we, we can't do that. And then trust God that he's going to provide for you and help you through whatever that situation is. We sometimes look, we frown. See, some of you are frowning because you're like, man, it's going to be rough. I got to draw a line in the sand. No, it's for your good. If you're driving on a mountain mountainside and there's a steep cliff, you want guardrails, right? It's to keep you safe. It's to help you. Draw a line in the sand. Let me keep going. Look at verse 15. At the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food and every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and mediums in his entire kingdom. Wow. This is Daniel's testimony of 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 him being committed to holiness, his testimony of his faith. This whole situation could have gone in an entire different different, uh, direction. But God has his favor on Daniel and the rest of these young boys. And here's the key, is that Daniel's intent was not to please man. He wasn't trying to do this for really King Nebuchadnezzar. He wanted to please God. He wasn't concerned about whether uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was going to be pleased with the way they looked after the end of this. He was concerned about pleasing God. So this kind of leads to my final point, and that is that we have to rely on your God-given affirmation. You have to trust that God will affirm you. Leave the results up to him. Yeah, I preach a sermon every, you know, each Sunday. I'm doing this to please God. I know that some people may not like what I have to say, but I'm on a mission because God sent me to do this. That's my, that's my assignment. And in your life, you're going to be given an assignment to represent Jesus in your job, in your home, at your school. And you're going to have to make a decision to draw a line in the sand and say, God, I'm just going to rely on you affirming me. I'm going to put the results up to you. And in this case, we see that God moved in a powerful way. They were 10 times better. I will tell you right now that if you rely on on God's affirmation, he's going to make you 10 times better. And it relates to a lot of these issues. We're trusting in our society, but I'm telling you, if you trust in the word of God, you're going to be spiritually, physically, financially, uh, emotionally healthier if you do it his way. Been doing it this way for a long time. Yeah, and I've seen results in my own life and the results of my own family's life. It's important that if you leave here today, you know that in your life, you're going to need to draw lines in the sand and say, you know what? I'm going to just rely on the God-given information, which I see in the word of God. I'm going to rely on God's identification. When I read the scriptures, I rely that 
this is my passport. It tells me who I am and it tells me where I'm going. It's a difference. Gives you some stability in life. I'm going to rely on God's affirmation, meaning that my life is committed to him. And I have to put the results in his hands. So I'm going to share the good news. I'm going to share Christian values. I'm going to love people in the midst of it. I don't have to be angry when I do it either. Won't go back to it, but, but you'll find that Daniel has favor because he's not angry at people, spitting in people's face. He's like, well, look, I think I got a plan B. And God has favor on him. That's what he would want us to do. Trust him. Be faithful and do what he requires of us. I want to just close by just sharing you that Daniel sets his life apart from the Babylonians in a number of different ways. One of those ways is through fasting. Prayer and fasting. Some of you all may have heard the term of a Daniel fast. A Daniel fast is really formed by mankind, but it comes from scriptures. We see here in chapter one, we just went through and that he only ate vegetables. Um, we'll see in Daniel chapter nine that he fasts and prays. And in Daniel chapter 10, you'll see that he fasts for 21 days. So mankind has looked at the scriptures and that's where you come up with a term, Daniel fast, because it is to fast for 21 days. Yeah, and people look at, okay, I'll eat just fruits and vegetables for that time frame. But a fast ultimately is so that you might uh, increase your connection with God by removing worldly temporary pleasures so that your focus can be on God, that you can be committed to him, that you can hear his voice, that you would then begin to commune with him. And so we've given you a couple resources. Well, one primary resource is the word of God, which we encourage you to read. But two, we've given you also brochures. If you haven't received a brochure, you can pick up a brochure on what is fasting. And you'll get some details on what that looks like. There are a number of different ways to fast. You don't have to do a Daniel fast. If you like some more guidance or direction on that, uh, we recommend a book. It, uh, it's actually a 21-day fast journal. It's actually a guide that you can actually follow through. And you can pick that up on Amazon and get it in the next 48 hours. Um, but what we want to do is we want to really encourage you to participate in a 21-day fast starting on January the 14th. That is next Sunday. And we'll take that 21 days all the way to February the 3rd. So this week, we want to encourage you to do some study, some research on what it means to fast and why you should fast. And when you do that, you'll become more educated. You might need to do some special shopping. You might need to dust off that blender at home. Get your fruit smoothie and vegetable smoothies going. I don't know. Whatever it is, everybody, I want you to have your own fast. I also want to say that if you have pre-existing medical health concerns or challenges, you need to seek your doctor, okay? We love you. And we'll tell you that the scriptures talk about fasting. I won't go into it in depth. Um, but I'll tell you that Jesus starts off his ministry fasting. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 4. And then you go over to Matthew chapter 7. He assumes that we fast because he gives us instructions on how to fast okay i won't go into it i can preach a whole message on fasting okay but it's important that you do the research start studying get ready so next sunday uh, we want to encourage you to just participate in a fast and see what god does in your life i know that he's going to strengthen you emotionally physically and spiritually if you do that and so do the research this week and we hope that you move forward in that you know, also Daniel participated in what was called the Passover. In Daniel chapter 10, you'll see that not only does he fast, he does this in the month of Nisan, which is the first month of the year where they celebrated Passover. It's January, and it's the first Sunday of the month. So here at Central, we celebrate communion. And Jesus really brings about a new understanding of the Passover with a new covenant when he sits with the disciples. Because as he sits with the disciples... He no longer points to the lamb's blood that was found in the Passover. He points to himself. And he begins to talk about the fact that he's going to give himself completely for them. So communion really is symbolic of, of what Jesus has done for us. And he tells us to do this in remembrance of him. And I just want to give you a moment to begin to, to pray. Ask God for forgiveness of any of your, sin, of your sins. And because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross,
He's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness just by praying, asking for forgiveness. So at this time, if you haven't received a communion, some communion, just raise your hand and you can get the elements and we'll have some ushers hand that out to you. So just raise your hand and we can make sure you get that. If you're at home right now online and you need to grab something, now is the time. Go grab something, uh, just some crackers. We, you can have some juice so that you can participate in communion with us. As we're doing that, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that a man should examine himself. So I want to give you an opportunity to just spend some time in prayer, praying that God would cleanse you of all unrighteousness and believing that he is able to do that. If you're holding a grudge, forgive. If you did done something or said something or thought something that was, was not pleasing to God, ask God forgiveness. Just spend that time doing that and I'll close us out in prayer and then we'll take communion together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Because in it we find light and life. In it we find that you died on the cross for our sins. And God, we also have the confidence of knowing that because of your great sacrifice, because you got up three days later with all power, that we can pray and know that you're a God that forgives. So God, your word says that if we confess our sins, you'll be faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So, God, we ask that you might now cleanse us as we make us white as snow. Fill us with your spirit again. Give us the confidence to be able to take communion and take it worthily. Help us to forgive others that offend us. Help us to love our neighbor. Help us to love those who are our enemies. Help us to be kind and loving, God. Help us to take communion together as brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the Bible we find specific directions on how to participate in communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. For the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all and take the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then he said, in verse 25, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us take and drink together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for communion because we are your, your kingdom. We're your students, God. And we want to represent you. So, God, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins, and we ask that you would now let us be a light to a dark and dismal world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's stand on our feet and let's close out with some worship. Hey, Central Online family. Thanks for watching Central's YouTube channel, but don't stop. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream, and then share it with friends. If you're blessed, go to our website, click on the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. We want to connect with you as well. So you can do that by filling out our Connect card on our website under I'm New Here. You can even plan your next visit here at Central. This way we can meet you in person. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.